Welcome to this episode of Bounded in a Nutshell. Remember to take a moment to click on the link below to donate to a very special organization. Figure Skating in Harlem is the first organization in the world to combine the power of education with the grace and discipline of figure skating. It is dedicated to developing confidence, leadership, and academic achievement in young girls from low-income backgrounds. The numerous stories of success from its alumni owe a great deal to the unique blend of mentoring and self-expression that is championed by FSH. Remember, no donation is too small or too large to keep the dream alive for these exceptional young girls. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. Welcome everyone to Bounded in a Nutshell. Today, my guests are Nadia Bowes and Corey Stoll. A brief introduction. Um, Nadia Bowes was born in Bradford, Connecticut. She graduated with a BA in Sociology and French from Dartmouth College, later gaining an MFA at NYU. She appeared on Broadway in Aaron Sorkin's The Farnsworth Invention, opposite Hank Azaria. Other Broadway credits include Peter Shanley's Doubt, directed by Doug Hughes and Mary Zimmerman's Metamorphosis. Nadia has appeared in numerous off-Broadway productions, including Eyes of the Heart, Tempest Tossed, Wildflower, Julius Caesar, Describe the Night, and her wildly acclaimed and hilarious turn as Ella in Aaron Posner's Life Sucks. In 2019, Nadia played Lady Macbeth opposite a little-known actor in John Dahl's visceral, inventive production of Macbeth at Classic Stage. Uh, she also appeared on television in Orange is the New Black, Quantico, The Strain, and NCIS. Her film credits include Every Dog's Day, Little Ones, Nonstop, Josie and Jack, and The Unintended. As a writer, her searingly moving piece about the tragic loss of her sister, Sasha, to a drug overdose, Dear Dealer, was featured in the online series, This American Life, and in Time Magazine in 2018. Corey Stoll was born in the Upper West Side and shot to fame playing Congressman Peter Russo on Netflix, House of Cards, receiving a Golden Globe nomination in 2013. He followed that up. He, sorry? Okay. Okay. He followed that up by taking on the role of Dr. Ephraim Goodweather in Guillermo del Toro's hugely popular vampire series, The Strain. Before his explosion to the wider audience, Corey has been making a name for himself on both coasts, whether it be in off-Broadway productions like Intimate Apparel, opposite Viola Davis, or playing Marco in Gregory Morsh's critically acclaimed production of Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge, opposite Scarlett Johansson, Lev Schreiber, and my first guest on this series are one of my favorite people in the world, Jessica Hecht. Corey has been a mainstay over the last few summers at the Delacorte, appearing in such productions as Trollis and Cressida, Julius Caesar, and <clears throat> Othello. <laughs> Corey would like to publicly <laughs> thank the actor who played Othello for, and I quote, teaching me everything I know. <laughs> uh, he made, he's made numerous television appearances in shows like The Deuce, Billions, Baghdad Central. Film appearances include sublime perform a, a sublime performance as Ernest Hemingway in Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, and other movies like This Is Where I Live, Lucky Number Eleven, First Man, The Seagull, Cafe Society, and the seemingly inevitable entry into the Marvel Universe as Darren Cross, AKA Yellow Jacket in the hugely entertaining Ant-Man. He landed the role of Police Lieutenant Shrank in Steven Spielberg's highly anticipated adaptation of West Side Story, and will soon be seen in Netflix news series, Ratchet, which follows the story of nurse Mildred Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Nadia and Corey are the proud parents of Nikolai, and we are delighted, guys, to have you as my guest today. Thank you for doing this. What an introduction. Thanks for having us. You're good at this. Yeah, well, you know, I'm working on it. You never know what post-coronavirus might make us do for a living. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, uh, there's one elephant in the room I just have to get to. Nadia, you are a descendant of a certain Josephine de Beauharnais, i.e. the first wife of Emperor Josephine, the first wife of bloody Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Can you tell us a little bit about knowing, growing up, knowing that was part of your history here in the States? Because we just got to address that because Corey keeps punching up in his life. As we just sure, know how sure. He, well, it's not, also, it, it, it gets even juicier because it's, it's, I'm a descendant of her, but also um, the blending of her family and the Romanov family, the, the last... The, oh my God. the czarist family of Russia. One of my most, uh, I, I most loved periods of history was that late 19th century into the early 20th century Russian history. I mean, I studied that at 
A level in England, and it was just I took every class I could at Yale with that. That was just oh okay wow yeah yeah so yeah so that was my family my my try without trying to bore you with too many details but but my 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 great grandfather was the minister of agriculture under the last Tsar but also um, my so Josephine's son um, a grandson excuse me Maximilian married the daughter of Nicholas the first. Wow. They had a son, Nicholas, who, um, uh, or Nikolai, who is my great, great grandfather. So, wow. the, the, so I'm the, 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 those two families coming down and, and my mother was a title, the Duchess and a princess. And when she became an American citizen, uh, my mother has three sisters. My mother's Natasha. She has three sisters, Olga, Anna, and Masha. And, wow. uh, <laughs> I can check How Chekhovian. Yeah, I know. and um, and when she became an American citizen, she had to raise her right hand and promise to not start the monarchy here, and she had to give up her titles. Yeah, um, but she does have an embroidered pillow on her bed that says, "It's not easy being a princess." <laughs> so, uh, but I, you know, it's interesting in terms of like growing up knowing that is. I don't know if any of you have immigrant parents, but um, there's an interesting thing that happens where they they're focused on assimilating. Yeah. Uh, and and at the same time telling you like you know remember who you are like they 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 it's a mixed message of it's almost uh, contradictory is this thing like don't speak english or like you know don't speak your native whatever we have to speak this right. it, it, that's a very broad term of it but at right. the same time and, you know it's sort of beaten into your remember your roots remember your roots yes, you know and stand out for excellence stand yeah. out because of your excellence but don't stand out too much that you're going to be a problem yes yes that's a great way of putting it you know? wonderful um, yeah and, uh, but 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 i think and i and i do also believe there's a whole story my 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 grandfather left my mother and, and her sisters and oh my god and during world war ii and they escaped nazi germany to the south of france and cargo trains and there's a whole like you know, uh, and, and also the, the Romanov family is very problematic. They were not, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's fun to think about, you know, castles and jewels and, and, and royalty and all that kind of thing. And um, like my grandmother had play dates with Anastasia and, but, but like also they killed a lot of people and were responsible for a lot of people suffering. And, and it, yeah. was, it was a, an inherited um, dynasty, you know, of, of people just, and, uh, and unquestioned authority. Uh, and we know that's a problematic, that's problematic, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, um, but I do believe, but there, but there is trauma in, the, in that lineage too. Uh, and also the way that that family died and, and the way my, you know, my, my, um, my mother wasn't living large in Germany. You know, they were growing potatoes in their bathtub. They were, they had only, basically only their titles to get them out and um and they but they were they were quite poor and and um but it, but i think there is there is a feeling of uh i think there i believe in that sort of generation the inherited trauma from generations before i believe that that yeah. does affect children and um but my mother also became a pediatrician when she yes. came um, when she, she didn't, English was not her first language and there weren't many female doctors. She's 86 now because I think she saw her mother left with four children and no occupation except being a titled woman who has watercolor skills. And, mm -hmm. and I think she thought, I'm never, that's not going to happen to me. And, uh, so that it's interesting. It's funny. You've gone from, you know, monarchy to actually quite the opposite of that, which is like, you know, pull yourself up with your book, you know, and all that. And right, very, right, in fact, right. you've gone below that. You, you, it's not like even working class. It sounds like it was even poorer and you had to come back up to the working and right. the middle class and all right. that stuff. So it's and quite her, a journey. Yeah. And her mother would say, you know, remember who you are. Remember, remember who you are. That, who you are. That, yeah. That was their sort of like, like, you know, uh, even no matter, even if you're wearing, you're not wearing fancy things or you don't have much, remember inside who you are, you know. I think that's a very important message just in general, regardless of where you come from in many ways. Um, Corey, uh, you have, I mean, that history just blows my mind. I can sit and talk to you about it for hours. <laughs> Corey, you come, we, will. we will. Corey, you come from a very, uh, you, I mean, your father founded the Beacon, was your co-founder of the Beacon School. Mm -hmm. um, I think your grandmother was big into theater and drama or something, correct? So has it always been an inevitable journey towards 
excellence in performance? Mm -hmm. uh, or what, what's, the, what's the story with you in that sense? Well, you know? no, I mean, the, uh, my, my grandmother on my father's side was a, a sculptor. Um, uh, and that, that's the only person in my, in my family who was an artist, really, right. of, of any kind. Um, but uh, but I, I, you know, on my mother's side, it was really, they were all lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I didn't, I guess there was part of me that assumed that that's what I was supposed to be, um, right. you know, way back. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I definitely think my, my grandmother my, um, on my mother's side, Marge, uh, who, I rem you know, she always used to tell the story that her husband um, would go to see theater with her until she took him to see the original production of uh, Death of a Salesman. And he was emotionally <laughs> <laughs> devastated. He said, this is, yeah. this, it, 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 touched, it touched him so deeply that, I, that he, he, he swore to never see a play again. Wow. Um, he said, you know, this is, <laughs> this is my life, you know. Yeah. I, I, I am really Loman and I don't need to be confronted with that. Uh, and so she occasionally got him to, you know, see, you know, musical comedies. Uh, right. But I think she had been, you know, ever since then, she had been searching for a, a an outlet, suitable uh, a theater going partner. And then, yeah. you know, when I turned like 11, 12, she started taking me to stuff. And uh, that was, that was really an incredible um introduction to the to the theater um yeah I, I don't think i think it took a long time to 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 go from i love this this is amazing to this is something that i could actually do right but but that was an incredible to 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 to, to see such great theater from from such an early age i think it was so it was like coming in and seeing the shows on broadway off broadway all that stuff you know seeing basically everything she everything she'd have loved to go see with her <laughs> she took yeah. you with instead yeah, yeah. luckily yeah. i hate to see musicals so i want yeah. you know, more <laughs> depressing have you guys done have you guys done musicals before do you sing i i did in high school um <laughs> uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah i did in high school that's how i started out and then um and i love them and i secretly love them i don't secretly love them i would mean i would but then i got to new york and it was just like I don't know, man, like, I can sing, I can sing, I can dance mm -hmm. better. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I love to sing, but like, when you get here and like the, the people who have been training their whole lives, it's just it's incredibly intimidating. It's another level. It's I can be in level. one of those, like, those plays that need actors who sing. Yes. But don't really actually mean that. <laughs> <laughs> they actually, like, no, I think you should be an actor who sounds like a Broadway singer. And I'm like, exactly. You know, and that they would don't be, really that need that. <laughs> Because they're so like, did you like, guys did you guys meet at NYU? Were you there at the same time, roughly? No, we, just, we just we just missed each other, right? Um, and then uh, we met at a uh, alumni event uh, a few years after I graduated. Yeah, our teacher right. Jim, Jim Caller would have these things called Lotsy nights, where people would come bring work that things they were working on or whatever alumni could come and have a drink. One, yeah. Like, yeah so here's my question. Um, I'm going to sort of jump back and forth and all that with stuff like that. But I want to get to the most recent, my freshest memory of you guys was watching you play Lady uh, Macbeth and Macbeth. Um, I, when I first heard of it, I can't remember who was telling me about it. And I just went, uh, uh, do they really want to do that? Because I can't <laughs> think of anything more frightening than playing, doing that role. Uh, apart from maybe Anthony and Cleopatra, playing that role with my actual partner, do you know what I mean? Like, well, how was the, how did that come about? Because I remember in the changing room in, uh, with our raccoons, Corey, uh -huh. um, at, at the Delacorte, you saying that was on your list, you know what I mean? You, you wanted to do that and Hamlet, right? Those were your two, yeah. And then very soon you got to do it. So I know that it was a passion project for you. Was it a passion project for you now? Did you, was it something you were hoping to do or what? You know, I think it's funny, I mean, I, I, I I've always been aware of Lady M, obviously. Um, I, I haven't been like, many people very, very definitively have her on their bucket list. And I, and I <laughs> think because she's just, it's, 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 an inti it's intimidating. It's actually yeah. intimidating. And, and um, 
and so it hadn't been on like in in the forefront of my mind as, as something no it was it was not um but then um and, but then he, well, he he had worked with John Doyle before, and and so John had offered him this part, mm -hmm. and like slowly, so I'm like, so who's, who's playing your lady? Yeah, who's doing that? And he's like, I don't know. We got there's like a list of people. I'm like, okay, okay. You know, and I, and, uh, and John didn't. I didn't. John didn't know me, and and and, mm -hmm. and um, and I was doing Life Sucks at the time. I was like, well, you know, he should come see Life Sucks, and and and. And, and, and Corey said to him, you know, you should, you should meet my wife. And, mm. and, uh, and it was never, it was always, you know, anyway, so I ended up actually auditioning for John mm. and, um, mm -hmm. and we just, and we just hit it off. And, you know, at the end of 45 minute conversation, at the end of that, you read the scene with him. He's just, it's just so civilized. You all do auditioning so much better um, than Americans, I think. In, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a cup of tea session, but I, I remember, exactly. I remember going from here where I trained in the States and back to England. And my first audition there was at the RSC. And I remember I went in and my first audition was with, with, with Michael Attenborough and it was an hour long. And I, an hour long is about three months worth of auditioning constantly in America, do you know what I mean? I know. Just, I was this guy out of drama school, he didn't know me, it was an hour long of chatting and then the next meeting was 45, I mean it's just a different culture, isn't it? You it know? is, and, and, it's, yeah. and, and it's superior in that regard, <laughs> it's been my yeah. because, it's because so you just, at, the, at the end of it, John was like, thanks for coming into audition, I like started laughing, I was like, this was not an audition. <laughs> in my experience, this was not an audition. And, um, and then, the two of them had a secret meeting and and john was like she's my um artistic choice is that okay with you you know and he's like i probably should cast someone i don't think he, he, like what they, who could like probably bring more more famous to go bring people <laughs> but i want to cast her which says a lot about him and yes you know and and i've done a lot of shakespeare just not a lot in new york i worked with a shakespeare company in new haven for many many years and yeah and um, and I and I did do the original, the first uh, Julius Caesar in the park, uh, my first job out of school, and 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 this three person Tempest, and you know so Shakespeare is definitely you know it's something I love to do. Yeah, and I and I remember you know that incredible day of of watching you um, read audition for Amelia. That was just a day of just such talent in that room, and I was just like. Why don't I know these people in the city? It's quite extraordinary. And you'll, you'll, you'll so work. I hate. I have always said that I would hate to be have to be the decision maker. You almost want to just go. I like. I like. I like. Now you decide because that was one of those days where, I mean, it, it, the work was just astounding. Um, tell us because there are going to be people watching this who Lady M is on the bucket list and Macbeth's on the bucket list. Before we move on to film and TV and other so let's let's talk about this. How Corey? How was approaching this guy that was on your bucket list finally i mean what was that like playing macbeth you know um it was it was it was surprisingly closer to to hamlet than i had expected it to be mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I, I i was i'm very familiar with hamlet been in a couple productions i've seen a lot and i've always sort of seen hamlet as this role that is encyclopedic you know mm -hmm. that, that that over the course of the four hours <laughs> he goes <laughs> through every possible emotion and there's so much yeah. humor and so much pathos and there's a thriller there's a horror story it's just it's just it's it's got so many colors mm -hmm. and we sort of saw um macbeth as a very um not one note but mm -hmm. uh is a more of a of a straightforward genre piece, <laughs> you know, if, if Shakespeare can have a genre piece, and and I remember, and then so, and I, I but I wasn't that familiar. I and, and yeah. frankly, when we were having that conversation, it, you know, we were both doing such incredible roles. <laughs> yeah, already. <laughs> you know, but, and, and, it, and and it was just sort of like, well, I can't go back and do bowling yeah. book or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I don't really want to. Yeah, yeah. What's uh, next on the list? Right now, I have to do something that's more challenging or right? yeah. has more colors. Yeah, um, or it's more complex and more challenging, and um, and so that it, it was sort of like, well, there's only so many of these. There's only about three or so, four left. I'm yeah. <laughs> so, you know, just sort yeah. of checked off the list, and yeah. and and so I didn't. I actually didn't come with a lot of preconceptions, and I remember the first couple of times I read through the script, I was like, this is 
this is fun, it's beautiful language. It's a thriller. <laughs> but it's a little one note, I thought. Yeah. And then I had the incredible experience. Nadia was doing Life Sucks and they got extended and we had already rented this house in, in Cape Cod for two weeks and she managed to get one week off. And I had, I spent the second week completely by myself in this house in the, in the woods. And I had, I had Macbeth to prepare. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just, it was really one of the most extraordinary artistic experiences just that week because it was a pure sort of interaction between me and, and the text without any four-year-old. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 and I want to come, I want to come down to that with the, the idea of you and the text. I remember having a similar um, nonchalance and lack of excitement when I was approached to play Romeo, because I had a conception of Romeo, this sort of slightly wet blanket guy in love whining that you're supposed to care about. You know, I had mainly because I had judged it on the interpretations I'd seen or what people had said or whatever. And I remember the similar thing is when I said, okay, you know, before I say no to this, let me read it. Actually, it seems logical, read it. <laughs> and then you see all this and you realize you've got to bring yourself to every character. It doesn't matter how anyone else has played it or whatever. It's like, it's what is that relation to you? And that's the, that's the answer for you is whether you can form a relationship with it. And suddenly it opened up to this guy that's called the complete opposite of that. And I think Macbeth is a great example of the, the guy who, you know, he kills whatever. But those speeches are about steep so far in blood and whatever, and I can't go back. And, 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 and the, the, and of course, tomorrow, tomorrow, I mean, just moments like that of, of Hamlet-like philosophy and, and self-appraisal, you know, it's, it, it, it's wonderful when it comes as a surprise in that way, you know? Yeah, um, and, and I think yeah. that I think the, I think so much of the, the work of, of, of any, well, any really good role, but mm -hmm. especially with Shakespeare, is to hold on to that, that surprise and mm -hmm, that yes. very personal uh, uh, experience that the actor has when they first start to understand what they're reading. Yes. You know, and it's a very fragile thing that in a two and a half week rehearsal process, which is sometimes what you get, can easily get sort of stomped over. That you, mm -hmm. you do something and it works and you lock it up. You don't have time to keep exploring. We got this, this is set. I, you know, I feel. I, I feel a sense of safety and comfort in ma having made this choice and now yeah. I'm going to move on to something else. Yeah. And to, to give yourself that space and that breathing room to, to make a different choice the next time you yeah. do. It's yeah. just not, yeah. just not easy when, you're, when you know an audience is, 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 uh, is coming soon. Two, two weeks away and stuff. Another thing you, you would enjoy rehearsing in England where it's usually about six and a half weeks of rehearsal to just keep by the end of it you're like can we please just have an audience you know Nadia talk about perceptions I, I don't think there's you know a role with more perceptions on how to play than Lady Macbeth out there especially for you know there aren't as many great female roles even the great Shakespeare gave us so that always ranks up there I mean how was that like making it yours as opposed to one of the many you've heard about you know yeah I think you know exactly what you say like I think that's partially why I was like you know I mean also people feel a strange possess uh, um, possessiveness over this play too I feel mm -hmm. like oh that's my favorite play and like, yeah. and I, or like, and like, I know how to like, and so if there's like a, and there's so many words that are used to describe her. She's crazy. She's insane. She's bloodthirsty. She's, she's, uh, you know, she's power hungry. She's, and, 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 and I was like, that none of that is helpful to me <laughs> you know, at all. Yeah. And, and, and I think credit to John Doyle, like from day one, we were on our feet. We did no table work. And I, and I really, I was nervous because I was coming into rehearsal. I was like, I really actually don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and every day he would just say to us, you are enough, you are enough, you are enough, you are enough. Go around the room, you are enough. And I know that those words are used are sort of very self-helpy. We hear them a mm -hmm. lot, you know, like mm -hmm. the meme or something, you know. But like if you really apply it to Shakespeare, I think it, it, it's a very basic thing. It comes down to your voice. 
Mm -hmm. else, and John would be on every one of us, be like, even Mary Beth Peel, 78 years old, opera singer, you know, he'd be like, why, there's this little thing you Americans do when you feel like you've got to speak Shakespeare, you put on a little, you know, and it's just like a little, it could even just be a slight little level, but it's just farther, you're just moving slightly away from yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how do you make this person sound like you? And, and also, and, and, and I, and I started to get this sense of her as, I think just the, it's just the text. It's just the, yeah, words. Yeah. it's the clues in the text. What does she say? What yeah, does yeah. she say? And, 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 and that we had an advantage in that, you know, I think the best compliment we got was like, someone was like, oh, I realized this was a play about a marriage. Yeah. You know, and I think that, so how are these two people, real people in a room? What's their private, what's their public life? And, and the way that John had us too, which was helpful to me, was that we were, these were real tribal people. We had, the women had pants under our dresses. We had these tartans. Um, it was cold, it was, it was dank, you know, they, they were kings and queens, but these were, these were people of the earth. Yeah. And so that informed me. Um, and, and yes, what does she say? The mention of the child, the mention of her father. Um, where does all of her, you know, her drive come from? And what I, I heard Judy Dench say, you know, well, the only way that I could wrap my brain around what she does is that I think she just loved her husband so much. And I was like, no, mm -hmm. I don't think that works for me. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I'm sorry, Judy. <laughs> sorry, yeah. Judy Dench. But she was also doing it at a different time. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and I, but I, I just, I just couldn't get behind that. I was like, right. I think she wants things for herself. Mm -hmm. I think it's not just, and, and the way I started to think of her was just someone who probably wanted to play with the boys. And maybe when she was young, her father let her and she got out to hunt and she was able to do all these things. And at a certain age, she had to go indoors because she was a woman and she's yeah. not able to do the womanly thing. She's not able to have a child. And whose fault is that? Maybe not hers, maybe his. But would right. male fertility ever be something that was talked about? Absolutely not. So like what like this is last chance this is like there were times when i would do the play and i'd be like i'd give myself the i'd be like so if this doesn't work um this is my last chance and i i will commit suicide if this doesn't happen like right. you know, like i would give myself that clear that, that like this is this is last chance right for some sort of purpose like a per per person hungry for purpose and it goes wrong it goes awry for sure mm -hmm. but 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 all the things that i came to find out about her were all from the text i didn't put anything on her i didn't i didn't come up with a story that wasn't based to force it in the text exactly well i we, I, we had um the wonderful uh kristen Linklet as a guest and you know her whole thing is about um that connection between the visceral and your imagination and in the middle of that is actually she had this wonderful phrase that i've taken away which is like shakespeare's taking care of the argument for you mm -hmm. now it's about you filling in he's got the argument down because sometimes part of that voice thing you're talking about putting on airs which i've noticed i noticed whatever also is that is is that need to speak it and be very clear with it and in that but actually, he's done the argument for you. you so how, how, do you, how yeah. do you connect with it? You know, I, think, I mean, there is also the the unique challenge of of speaking it for a modern, especially American audience. And yes. it's just, I think every production needs. You know, a lot of it has to do with putting faith in your director that, yes. that they are telling the story. So you don't have to tell the story in every line that you speak, yeah. and also just a. A, 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 an acceptance that the audience is gonna, if you're lucky, get 40% of what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And so, you know, those those things that are super, super important that if you if they don't hear, they don't hear the character's name, if they don't hear you, you know, stress the negative on this particular line, they're gonna get confused. You know, you gotta pick your battles. Yeah. But, uh, trying to serve it up to the audience as you're also trying to have a scene with somebody else is just yeah you're just going to be working really hard uh, working really hard that, 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 that hamlet tells the players not to do <laughs> yeah exactly um so that's a really nice segue about the transition to your i mean i guess like i said in my introduction house of cards was a big transition for you into the 
it, it almost is Shakespearean delivery of, you know, Kevin Spacey turning to the audience in a very Richard the Third way and all that stuff. And it's funny because he, I had just finished the Richard the Third with him and he was starting on House of Cards two weeks later. So he took that with him. Um, I, this is a this is a bit of a tricky question and stuff, but I, I think it's worth talking about. Two of the big, when I think of Corey, your, your career trajectory, I'd say, apart from the great work you've done on stage, but a big part of being introduced to the international audience was doing uh, Midnight in Paris, your amazing Ernest Hemingway, and the House of Cards. You know, I think you can track your career very nicely, the trajectory with those two projects in many ways. Apart from your great work in them, you were working with, the, I don't think anyone can question the talent of a Kevin Spacey or the talent of Woody Allen, whose movies I grew up with, but they're very divisive characters, shall we say that? I think that's a, a polite word of saying it. Mm. How, 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 how do you relate to those projects you did with them, given how important they were for your career, how grateful and how brilliant you were in them, and the association, they now, I haven't, the association of having done that Richard III and playing Buckingham, which is why I'm here in the States. It brought me over in many ways to the audience. I mean, how do you associate with that now? I mean, how do you defend or not defend or muse about the fact that these are important people in your career? You know... I, I really have put you in the, on the spot there. No, I, think, I, you know? <laughs> I mean, I... I, I uh... I, of course, uh, can't, can't, ign can't ignore them and can't ignore the realities of the people that were hurt, mm -hmm. uh, who, were, who weren't me. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? I think, I think, I, I, I think in, in the past, a, a, a valid argument was like, well, uh, you know, I didn't, I never saw anything, nothing bad. Mm -hmm. you know, he's always a nice guy to me. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a very hard thing because on a, on a certain level, how much of one's job is it to, to know everything about your coworkers and, and mm -hmm. your, and your employers? Um, God, I don't really even know how to answer this question because, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really proud of the work that I got to do in those things. Mm -hmm. And I think um, from, from my perspective, it's very, I, I know what my participation was in, in that work. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm proud of it. So it's easy for me to separate out the work from the from, program. Yeah, yeah. But I can't. I can't, I can't put that on anybody else, you know, from the outside, I could definitely see that it, it, it would be impossible to, to, to separate those things out. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, if I had to then, you know, if this was a, a play that we were still doing and then I went back and I was still on stage with, with, with Kevin, yeah, a whole other set of issues. But, um, you know, in terms of that, I, I'm, I guess I'm lucky that it's it's in the can and yeah 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 <laughs> it's there right. I can't do anything about it yeah uh, um yeah I mean I I I I I think it's 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 been an extraordinary time to to be to be working in in film and television uh in terms of uh, uh, more, I don't know if there's ever been as rapid a, a change in people's perceptions of what is um, what, it, what, what is what is acceptable behavior and what's not, and what's what it what is everybody's uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. Because you know they were like as you know there were rumors about 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 Kevin and and mm. people would you know it was funny. Yeah, people were just like you know. It was it was it was it was funny how uh, uh, he was inappropriate, mm -hmm. and you sort of or predictable even. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think even just a few years later, with a little bit of distance, 
it's not so funny. Hmm. Uh, and I think, I think in terms of, in terms of that, I think we're all culpable in yeah. terms of the, um, you know, writing off how people were, 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 were taken advantage of yeah. as, as just a sort of a joke. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I definitely, I'll definitely, it's a, yeah, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. Is that big thing of life and art and the person and how? Oh yeah, you know, that argument of yeah, yeah. We sort of like go oh, yeah, rolling your eyes and is that enough now? And I think if one good thing has come out of this is that you realize that that's not enough, <laughs> you know, anymore. It's not. It doesn't excuse you to to that sort of altruistic argument of, well, they were always nice to me. It's not enough anymore. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I think people are more aware of that now. You know, Nadia, you had an incredible story. I saw you post about, uh, you were having lunch somewhere and there was some a conversation you were listening to. <laughs> Can you tell us? Because I think that encapsulates exactly sort of what we're talking about in a way. But could you just give us a brief rundown? Uh, of what sure, that yeah. sure. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah, so it was, just just before we could eat when we could eat lunch in places and uh and i uh I, I was at westville and um that place on 18th street and i was eating by myself i don't know if it was after an audition or i don't know what the heck i was doing but um and these guys came in these like these like bankery looking guys that's my projection mm -hmm. um but they were you know well-dressed nice suits good you know, worked out older like one of them was older say mid 50s or so and the other one was like maybe late thirties on his phone. And, and the older guy was loud and it was just, and it was just, he was like, man, like, I'm, I mean, have you seen her though? Her hips, like she's just gotten, she's got to watch it. Her hips have gotten so fucking huge. Like, I mean, if she wants to have kids, she's got to watch it, you know? And, and I was just sitting there like staring at him. Like he's going to see me. He's going to feel me staring at him. And then I can give him the look that I'm waiting to give him. And, and, and he just went on and just like took his coat off and sat down, you know, and I just, I wanted to fucking punch him. And like, and, 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 he went on, you know, just basically fat shaming this woman and, and someone he knew clearly that they both knew. And the young guy kind of was still on his phone, wasn't really responding. And, and, and I was getting ready to pay. God, I, I think I have to say something. Fuck. You know, cause I just can't, I can't walk away from this guy. And, and it just, it just bugged me. And, 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 and I think also what you said, like we have the language for this now, or we have the, and I was like, okay, do I walk the walk? Do I just say that I, so I, I, I went to the bathroom, like I gathered myself and I was like, cause usually <clears throat> normally I just be like, fuck, 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 you know, just like, and, and then, and then he'd be like, she's a crazy bitch. And then, and then he'd get to write me off. Right. So yeah. I went to the bathroom and I was like, I'm just going to tell the truth. I'm going to calmly tell the truth. And so I went up to him. I got, I got my stuff and I was leaving <clears throat> by the door and it was like, it's like, Hey man, uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt. And, uh, but I heard you talking about that woman, the woman. And he was like, Oh, uh, and I said, the woman with the fat hips. He was like, Oh no, I wasn't talking about you. I was like, Oh, I knew you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you were, um, but that woman, um, he's, um, I said, and I just wanted you to know, that I heard you was really loud and um, what you were saying that the woman that you showed so much disgust for hearing you talk about a woman that way makes me feel disgusted by you. And, and he was like, oh, but, well, I know her, I know her. And I was like, I, I don't care. That doesn't matter. And he's like, but, but no, see, I think I care about her. I care about, we're just worried about her. I was like, that didn't, he's like, I do love her. And I was like, that didn't sound like love to me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was just totally, and the young guy was like in his phone. Like, <laughs> and he was like, so, and, 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 and I was like, look, man, that's why I just, I just wanted you to know that that's what I heard. And, yeah. and that's how it made me feel. And yeah. then I said, have a good day. And I walked out and I stayed calm. And like, and he was just like, he didn't, you know, just like, and um, anyway, I don't know, but, the, but I guess, but, but because we have a language now and, and, and I think in, even if this guy still called me a crazy bitch and was like, all right, like, I think he might there's a culture that supports that now there's 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 yeah. there's there are things in the world where he might next time maybe 
he goes to the water cooler and, and, you know, and sees this woman or maybe, you know, he'll, he'll think about that. Or, or he, like, I, I felt like I had backup. Yeah. You know, yeah. Cult culturally, yeah. you know, even though we're still, um, the context, the yeah. context. So, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. He, and he could find the context that he couldn't, he couldn't just totally write me off. You know, he's yeah. like, he'd heard about these things happening or either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. About, and, and he supports it and he supports yeah. it. <laughs> But, right. Um, I, I think that's just a, a great story of how, I mean, yeah, we just, the awareness that, the, and the, the fact that there is now a sort of a vocabulary for it. There's a vocabulary where it's not either being quiet or being seen as quote unquote, the crazy bitch. There's a vocabulary now that can be used very powerfully for this sort of conversation, you know? Right, right, right. Um, right. Anyway, thank you for delving into the life part of the art part. I'm going to like, in, in, in the fact that there are a lot of young actors out there, although this is all very important because I don't necessarily separate it as much as some people do. But here's my, uh, a more technical question is for people that are New York theater actors that have made that have done the transition at different points in your careers to film and TV. A big question that is constantly coming up is what is that transition? I mean, what is that note you need to give yourself when you've come off, this, come off the stage and suddenly you're auditioning for a TV show or a film and in your head there's a voice saying, there's a voice saying, okay, just speak softer, just make everything smaller, smaller, but it's a lot more than that, you know, like, yeah. do you want to like, um, for our viewers, budding actors that are watching, what some of the big um, switches you made for yourself as a performer for that medium, coming into the medium of camera? Well, I definitely, I definitely think just being quieter and smaller is not the right way to do it. But I think, I think there's, you know, theater and, and film are different in two main ways, in, in the sense of space mm -hmm. and in the sense of time. And in terms of space, I, I think, the, I didn't make this up, the, and I'm sure people have heard this, but I, I, I think the most helpful way to, 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 to think of the difference between a uh, stage work and, and film and TV work is you're, you're used to being in different sized houses and different shaped houses in on on stage the way you would act in a you know a big you know 1500 seat proscenium theater with a balcony is just you would you would just instinctually act differently uh, from how you would in a little black box theater with mm -hmm. seats that's, you know, in the, you know, that's a thrust or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so much of that is, is just instinctual. There's, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you just, that's a human thing. You see how, you feel how many people in the room, you feel how far they are, and you adjust your performance accordingly. And so uh, the different, you know, a, a, a lens and the different lenses are different sizes, different sized houses. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know when you have a big wide establishing shot, uh, you know with a thirty-five millimeter lens from from far away, it's a different thing from you know if you have a sixty-five millimeter lens right up in your face. Mm -hmm. um, and you know a certain amount of that is instinctual, and a certain amount of that is is just experience and doing that and then seeing what it looks like on you know afterwards. But um, it's also I think pretty clear that it's a lot easier to go in that direction than the other way you know, okay tell, tell me about that why do you think that's why do you think that's the case maybe you know nadia has an idea i mean i'm just like sort of like yes it, it is only because i have my theories about it you know but i don't know if it's necessarily the same for everyone i mean what do you feel about that going going from being a theater, being theater a to actor, film vice versa because yeah going from i don't you know I have my theories too. I, I don't know if I can quite say. Some people may, you know, and, and, and truly all due respect because everyone's, you know, but like we see it when you, you know, I think uh, it used to be that I think film actors and TV actors were discovered by looking, by going to the theater. Yeah. And, and now it's sort of like this thing where like film and TV actors that start out that way get some street cred by going to the theater. Yeah. And like slumming it with us folks for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, and, but uh, time and again, I see a person disconnected, their voice and their body are not integrated 
in a way that that they, they don't tell a story with their whole body mm -hmm. um and I, I think the training we both got and the one i believe in is 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 one where you're is where your full body is telling the story that's the whole purpose of theater you know can you tell I, them can you tell your story with the whole body for on a camera well, I, you know, that's a good question. And, and I truthfully don't have as much film and television experience as he does. But I think, God, I mean, yes, yes, you can. But I don't know if the training is like that. I don't know. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know because I didn't start that way. Um, and, and I think vocally, too, I think there's just oftentimes it's like someone just can't fill it's it's learning how to be so theater too is like learning that truthfulness but then you have to like you know you stay but but you have to be this not real life yeah you know, yeah it's not, you are uh you are kind of a, a sort of larger organism on a stage and you have to be able to stay rooted to the truth of your emotions and of your you know but 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 also have within a with an awareness that you're bringing in all these other people too and mm -hmm. um so I, but I think it probably, you know, yeah, I don't know to keep, I mean, what, to, I think that's part of, part of my learning in, in film and television is actually to keep that sort of engine going. The one where it doesn't say like, oh, it's film and television, I'm just gonna cut myself off now because I think that's, yeah, what, yeah. I, that's what I used to do. And then, and then I, yeah. would, like I'd speak softly and I would, I would mumble. I would just mumble. I would just basically yeah, mumble. Like, I try yeah, and keep my face, but I keep my face perfectly still. That was like a, a <laughs> and I'm yeah, nailing I, this now. I'm nailing this. Shit, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I actually think film is more forgiving than a lot of us give it credit for. Mm. Okay. Um, I mean, I always think of of Andre Brower. Um, mm. When, 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 whenever, I, whenever I'm feeling like I'm I'm being too big or too theatrical. I think of Andre Brower. And he's, <laughs> his voice is like yeah. still in like Beautiful. you know yeah. in, in, in the homicide on the streets or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like Brooklyn like, Nine Nine, you know, he pulls it yeah. off in Brooklyn Nine Nine everywhere. <laughs> he, he he gets away with it because yeah. he is yeah. grounded. Yes, you know he's he's he, he, it's uh, uh, a combination of who he is, his instrument, and his training. Uh, and he never sort of shied away from it. And so, yeah. you know, is he, is there a theatrical, is there a theatricality to his performances? Yeah, but they're still really compelling. Um, Some of my favorites, it's funny you say that because I, I, this is a really important message you're giving because it is the first thing people think about. I have to shut down, I can't be as expressive. I have, it's all the things you can't do anymore. When I think the, the the story you should be telling yourself is like I want to do all those things, but finding a way of doing it in this house versus right. that other house, mm -hmm. right? I think this is what you're saying. It's like those things all have to be alive. One of my, you know, I, I, I think of people like watching Gary Oldman, who every moment is steeped in something theatrically true. <laughs> you know what I mean? In how I love, you know, and a yeah. lot of the people over the years that we've watched that we've loved. Um, I think there is that access you're talking about. It can't just be about shutting everything down and being as still as possible. But I think that journey is, that's the journey. The journey isn't suddenly from going louder to softer and all that. The journey is like, I know what works for me on this stage. I have to find a way to make it work for this uh, Cyclops, you know, as it were, the cameras, the, you know. Did it take you a while for that? Or were you aware of, is it easier to watch yourself now than it was 10 years ago? Because I know that's the, you know, I don't know. He doesn't no, watch himself. So, so much harder. He doesn't watch yeah. himself. It gets yeah, harder so much harder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, well, I think at first it was a novelty to it. I was like, yeah. oh, there I am. And, you know, it actually looks like I'm, you know, doing a good job. A good <laughs> actor in a movie. Yeah. And there's music and, you yeah. know, there's <laughs> special effects. Like, that was so cool. And yeah. now that's not so cool anymore. And I just see uh, the, the the faults in my yeah. The artificial I can't watch myself to this day. I, I I I can't think of anything I've done that I've watched in entirety. I even find a way of doing it at screenings of sort of not looking <laughs> when I'm looking. It's really it's terrible. I don't know why. It's like an amplified version of listening to your voice on the old answer machines. You know right. what I mean? And you go, that's not me. <laughs> you know, because you only do kind of see the faults. You see. 
because I know I probably can remember what I was thinking at the time. And every time you, you fail, you, you fall short of doing it as it was in your mind's eye, it's a dagger through my heart. You know, like it's really, it's better to, it's better to leave it alone. Um, Nadia, um, dear dealer, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the story is uh, you wrote this piece about the loss of your sister to the drug overdose. I mean, part of this series, I've, I've explained to you and the viewers know is I'm not interested in just doing an inside the actor's studio and then you did this and then you did this. We know all that. You know what I mean? I'm really trying to connect to the fact that every one of us artists have our real life going on and our real life tragedies and our relative successes and failures and pain. And that's kind of what feeds us. So. I, I was wondering if you could just share a little about the story of that, uh, uh, your sister Sasha, yeah. um, and how that has, you know, how that has fed you as a person. I remember someone when my mom died, you know, 10, 11, 11 years ago, I remember the first thing a dear friend of mine said, she just said, use it, just find a way of using it to make it constructive somehow so it's not just this. Mm-hmm. burden so can you tell us a little bit about Sasha um, yeah for sure and and uh I, she well, she's my older sister two and a half years older she's a social worker and a public uh degrees in social work and public health a real influence in my life a ridiculous person a lot of fun taught me many many things and my love for music, we were, we were very, very close. And then my father died in 2000, beginning of 2009, and she had a sort of sort of addiction thing that was problem, problem, blossoming, and then it really was full blown, and then many years of up and down, opiate addiction. And, um, and then she died in the summer of 2015. And we got married, I was six and a half months pregnant, and we were married in June. Um, she died in July, and our son was born in October of 2015. So it was a lot of life all at once. And, mm. and I think I also, <clears throat> I, I knew when it was happening, I was like, this is gonna take me a while mm. to unpack, you know, cause becoming a mother at the time when I was like, you're asleep, not sleeping and, 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 but I knew that I, in many ways, like it, it was kind of good that I was pregnant cause I couldn't self-destruct um, mm. and, and, uh, but, and I would just write, I was, and I, I've been writing my whole life and, and, and I'm, you know, taking it more seriously now, um, over these last few years, but I just started to write about it because I knew I had to, because I knew that there was this other thing going on when my baby was sleeping or whenever, and I, and, and this, and, um, it helped me process and, and kind of keep her close and, and trying to figure out, you know, just feel my way through it um, and the weight of all these new things. And in the midst of the, all this joy too, it was just like, that's mostly how, like some, most of the best things in my life have been coupled with the absolute worst. It's very mm-hmm. interesting. Um, and uh, so, and which I think is an interesting lesson because there's this, and that's just what life is, you know? and. But I, but the writing really helped me see my way through it, and I, and I started the Dear Dealer pieces. It's a, it's an imagined letter to the person who sold her the drugs that killed her, and it was, came out of a real need actually. I, I was really actually thinking about putting in an ad in the New Haven. She died in New Haven, um, where I grew up near that area, and uh, like being like, because I was like completely obsessed with who this person was, and I and I wanted to know more. I was just like, um, and then I just kept writing and I kept writing and I kept writing and. And then um, a friend of mine, <clears throat> uh, Shanta Fake, actually, some of you probably know Shanta, she works at The Public. She's uh, Oscar's right-hand woman. She used to run mm-hmm. this pub. And, um, and she said, How, you know, how's your writing going? And I told her, and, and she's like, I told her about this piece. I was like, I'm finishing this thing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's, you know. And, and uh, she said, well, let me introduce you to Elna Baker, who was at this America, the, the talent scout for This American Life. And, and like a couple days later, like we're gonna produce this, and and you know, and and um, and so it ended up being on This American Life, and and I I was me reading it, and um, and it was really it's not something I intended to I didn't know that it was gonna be that, uh, and but it came from a real um, a place of it, it was not done with any intention of any result, and 
And so the response that I've gotten from addicts and people who love them is, has been pretty tremendous and really feels like it's a furthering actually of my sister's work. She advocated for people who are really on the fridge um, with drug addiction and mental illness. And um, so it's a way of keeping her present and close. I'm also writing a larger a book about her. Um, mm -hmm. I now have like a literary agent um, and, and um, so that's what I've been doing this during this quarantine. And, and then also found out that someone, um, a really wonderful producer, it's early days, so I can't, but, but wants to make it into a movie. Yeah. Um, so like, that's kind of crazy. And, and mm -hmm. these are all things that I did not like look for, but it came from a real, um, and there's something about this story, I think that kind of wants out because I think it resonates yeah. with people. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway, but, but I think, I think there's, there's the stories, I, I think keeping your own story present as you're searching to tell other people's stories as an actor is really, really they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You can have one without the other. And, and so being aware of your own story, whether it's something you don't, you don't share with the world or you don't, you know, you write just in your journal mm -hmm. or with your therapist or whether, whatever, I think is part of being an actor and part of being an mm -hmm. artist because you can't, I always knew that. I always knew like, I can't, I can't tell someone else's story if I don't know how to tell mine. And right. I, by telling other people's stories, I learned compassion for myself. Right. I, well, how come when I find my way into this character, how come I can, I'm like, I find, I find love for them and all their flaws. Why can't I do that for myself? Right. You know, or, or shouldn't I try <laughs> at least, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I think there's a dance between those two things and we're lucky that we get to do it. You know, I yeah. think it's, it's, it's a, it enriches both worlds. Yeah. I think that's a that's a really uh, great way of seeing it because because I'm, here's the thing and I'll, I'll throw this out to you just on this topic before we move on. I've always been one of those actors that's very skeptical when I feel someone is trying to push me to use my experiences mm. for the benefit of this character and I, I always put up a guard against that. I always go like, mate. Can you just back off? You know, I always feel like uh, there's a whole school of acting that's that. I, I've always found it. Uh, I think when it's a deliberate thing, I think that's the thing. I think when it's a deliberate, oh, let me go back to think about when I lost my whatever to cry. I, I find that evasive and, and, and dangerous. I know I'll be making some enemies with people well, listening. But, but I think it's when it bleeds in, in general. Yes, in general. I think but when it bleeds in, when it, it, it it's again that word surprise when in dealing with this story you, you're surprised by the fact that it wells up stuff that's when it's genuine right I, I, you know i i always remember too i think it's also and as an audience member you can tell if mm. someone's emoting on stage you can go oh that's that's interesting that person's having a real experience because mm. i think that person I, there's there's a thing about um when you take possession of that memory, it's your memory and you're working so hard to feel that memory, it's alienating. It's, yeah. it's not generous, yeah. I think. And, and so finding that balance between this is, I might be understanding this experience through my own experience, but you have to still give it away. It still has to be in service of yeah. the, the story that you're telling and like, um, you know, I remember in singing class in grad school, I was singing the song Old Friend. And I remember I was like, it was like, I, I was like having a moment and mm -hmm. I was thinking about my old friend and it was like me, 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 me. And, and, the, and I was crying at the end. The teacher was like, all right, I want you to come back next time and do it. And just like, just think about your friend. <laughs> you like, let it be a thing. Like, 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 just like, just, you know, don't, don't, um, don't, like take such ownership of you know like like just have it be a nice thing and i and i did that and i I, had, I just like thought about my friend and doing it and didn't work so hard and at the end of it i looked out and everybody else was crying there's a there's an old saying the audience the audience doesn't want to see you cry they want to cry for you you know and, yes um, and, th and they yeah. want to be their old friend yes yes yeah they want to Sorry, see I, <laughs> I mean i mean it's, it's that's something and that's one of the things i did and i very much enjoyed about actually seeing the two of you 
uh, do the Scottish play going back to that was that I, there was there's all the there's all the I guess you call them the the moments right that everyone's looking for and it's funny how big moments often pass you by before you know they've they've happened and it's retrospective that you know it's a big moment and stuff you know and you guys really you know I I found that there wasn't a sense of here is the spot scene or here is the whatever scene in that you know um Corey what 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 as an actor who in certainly watching your screen there's a wonderful simplicity now I mean now that you know because you probably watched everything he's done but but I'd say if I was to use one trait of Corey is is a is a is a really wonderful simplicity of storytelling it's almost like do you know what I mean it, it's 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 the antithesis of of indulgent so given what we're saying about people who um this whole thing of I have to find this stuff what is your take on that what what is your approach to deeply emotional hard scenes scenes that would sometimes fall into the trap of um, what's the word emotional no, no, recollection no. and all that yeah no. yeah yeah uh well thank you um <laughs> pay me later pay me later mate <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh um i don't i mean i i think i think i am really hard on myself uh, as in general, as a person, I think mm-hmm. that's sort of a consistent thing. Uh, uh, I think you probably agree with that. I haven't said anything. <laughs> I'm sitting here. And I'm trying not to show anything on uh, my face. And so, and so, I think that's it. it, it you know, it's I have I have a very strong uh, critic, uh, mm-hmm. little voice in my head, and that's obviously can be a very destructive thing. But I do think that one of the benefits of that is that I it, it I it the my inherent bullshit detector um is very loud and and mm-hmm. sort of unignorable um and so um you know i think sometimes it can it can lead me as an actor to, into narrower choices uh than um than is ideal um but and i think that's that's what a lot of that's what the preparation is is for do you know like that experience when I was sitting by myself, reading Macbeth to myself, I got to go into, you know, say every speech really slow or really fast or loud or quiet and sort of ex- extend the boundaries. So that, because the instinct always, no, I mean, I think some, some, for some actors, when they get in front of an audience and they get really hammy and big, and my instinct is to, is to try to be as truthful as possible. But if I've gone through that experience in whatever work I do beforehand or in rehearsal of allowing myself uh, to be indulgent a little bit, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, and then times, oh, I went too far, that expands my own definition of what real is um, and what, you know, what, what not being indulgent is. So that when I'm. Yeah into the place where I'm starting to have a, a performance that's sort of, uh, uh, that's not set, but you know, the, the basic performance I'm going to give, um, mm-hmm. I can feel, uh, I can, I can, I can, I can feel comfortable in a, in that sort of larger space. So you're yeah, so. talking about raising the bound, raising the four, the walls around this character, giving yourself permission, in that imagination exercising to make those walls probably a bit more expansive than you'll initially think at first, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I yeah, mean, I'm yeah. not doing anything for the sake of Recovery. it being weird and, and, mm-hmm. and, and interesting. Uh, yeah. you know, always, always being about telling that story, always being truthful to the moment to moment reality of your characters. I mean, that, that right. always has to be the case. But in rehearsal, you can um, uh, you can expand for yourself what the out, outward bounds of that natural behavior is. And not being afraid to go on stage one day and whatever instincts lead you, come back, because it happened. I know we both had it. And after certain moments in Othello, we come into the room and we get like, I think, I, I think that was a bit much. You know what I mean? You're just like, sometimes yeah. you need to 
and sometimes it works and it doesn't. And, the, the, and that, you know, there's the big fear of falling on your face is so crippling. It's so crippling in our work, you know? And, and the number of times, I, and I find it a lot when filming because, you know, they're gonna grab this moment and that's it done. And I go home and I'm, you know, having my, you know, second cocktail maybe. And I go, God damn it, that's it, that's it. That's what I should have done. And that just needed- But the important thing is nine times out of 10. Go out, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely think yeah. nine times out of 10, they're gonna take that take where you did nothing you know what i mean you could no. you, you do all these takes you, know, so you do this one and you, you you did this really interesting thing you took this crazy pause when you should yeah. have or you cried when you should have laughed yeah. after you should have cried but it's just brilliant and then you look sure. and then you see it and you know it's the it's the That's one the where one you're just did. getting warmed up um <laughs> you know because that's maybe yeah. that, that's when you know when you're on stage you're creating a performance when you're on film or television, you're giving the editor the raw materials to Options. create the performance. Yeah. They're yeah. the ones who yeah. create the performance. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I think, I think that's, that, uh, that's part of what has led me to not want to look at myself too, is just that yeah. it, it feels alienating to me because it wasn't, that's, I did, I did, I did that. That's me on, on, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the arc that I was, trying to looking for create. yeah um, and you have yeah. to just yeah. unless, you're, unless you're a producer uh, unless you have you know unless you can veto somebody's choice you have you have to just it's just you're just you Step know back. You, when you're doing film and television you're you're rehearsing and they're capturing it and then they're going to turn it into something that's a shaped performance and sort of practicing the letting go of letting that be the case and going home and get ready for the next day, <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that sort of letting go, which is very hard to do on stage because you're coming back to the show to try it again, you know, to try it again and try it again and try it again and stuff. Guys, I could talk to you all day and this is so fascinating, but my producer is, is uh, telling me it's now time to open up to the many questions that are awaiting you. Um, uh, so Michelle, uh, yeah. where are you? Yeah, can we have one of those questions now? Uh, yeah, so one of the questions is from Stephanie, and it says, what is the most meaningful aspect of being partners engaged in the same art form? Mm -hmm. The most meaningful aspect. And remember that at the end of this uh, hour and a half, we're not going to be there with you. It's just the two of you, so make sure you say the right <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> and we're in a fucking quarantine. Um, can't be like, I'm going to go out for a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'll say for me, uh, <laughs> I would say for me, you know, growing up, I was sort of, um, I did not, I, it took me a while to admit that this is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and I, um, not that my parents weren't good people or, you know, but I, I think it was, I was constantly having to explain myself and, and in previous relationships, um, who, people who weren't actors and, um, and who didn't, who might have even been artists, um, but were somewhat um, threatened by what this was and, mm -hmm. and like saying stupid shit like, oh, no, no, you're not lying to me, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, that should have been the, 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 the thing, the telling thing right then, right? <laughs> Um, but like, so for me to be able to share the thing that I do with someone and not have to explain myself, I think that, um, on a deep level, not just in this, that particular play, but on like, a um, you know, uh, is, is, is really, is joyful, is, is really, um, a wonderful, um, really like the best thing ever, you know, to, to not have to say, well, this is what I do and, 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 and not even reporting back to each other, but actually having the same experience during the day to be in, um, in a, and to see each other in a new way. I mean, we'd not been, we'd, we'd, we'd gone to the same training. We'd never been in a rehearsal room together. We'd done, I did an episode of one of his TV shows and we'd done some readings, but I think uh, to, to have, after being together for 12 years, to experience each other in a new way, doing the thing you both love to do without having to explain, I think is mm -hmm. a, a, true, a true gift and working on a play that you knew was really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that helps it, it, it was, we heard, we heard. Yes, yeah. 
Corey? Corey? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think, I, I, I think, it, you know, we, obviously when you have two actors together, you're, you're multiplying the job insecurity, <laughs> multiplying the emotional just, insecurity, just regular insecurity. Um, but you're also, um, you, you have a level of, of, of respect for, for, what, for, for, for what the other one does. Um, and, and, and a sense of, um, a sense of continuity, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, uh, uh Sometimes when you're in the middle of something and it's just you have you're having some disagreement with the director or you you know you're 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 not you're not liking what you're doing, uh, it can feel uh, like the really like that's the end of the world and that you're just just always going to be like this and it's no no way out. And then when you see your partner going through something like that and you can see them doing it better <laughs> <laughs> you can when you when you can see when you get you get you get a little a little perspective yeah. i think we both give each other some perspective which is, which is yeah. nice. great next question great. michelle um this question is specifically about the delacorte and this is from peter um what is your warm-up for the delacorte and then <laughs> how does that compare to your warm-up for film and how do you navigate being mic'd and working outside okay wow that's a multi-part question there. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the warm-up changed from part to part. I, uh, uh, you know, I, I did three summers in a row and each part was, was successively uh, larger and more challenging. Um, and so with, for the first two summers, I would bike from Brooklyn out to the Delacorte every day and back. Uh, maybe, you know, unless it was raining, um, which was the most amazing warm up. I, I, you know, and then when I was doing, when I was rehearsing uh, Macbeth, I was doing the same thing. I would bike in. It was just a little bit shorter bike ride, but still. I hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the, just like, just the physical, the physical warming up and also just the sort of spatial awareness uh, that you get from not getting hit. <laughs> for that one time uh, <laughs> but you know by the time you show up in the theater I it's like I was really awake and it's also just a great way to decompress on the way back from theater um, you know if it was a tough night then you can just mm -hmm. sort of work it out if it was a great night then you can sort of revel in it um, but then I, I remember when we were, but I didn't do that for Othello because it was just too demanding a role um, I didn't it was just would have been I would have been too exhausted but I don't know I I I just sort of went, I, I sort of went through all my lines. I just said all my lines um, every night before the show, uh, which was, took a long time for, for Iago. Um, yeah. But I have to say it really, really quickly. But just, just to have that muscle memory, you know, I think that, you know, with Shakespeare, the second you're thinking about, the second you're thinking, you're, 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 you're dead. It's like tennis, you know. Um, you really just have to be in the rhythm. It has to be in your body. It can't be, uh, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't have your conscious mind be, uh, uh, be, be guiding the way. Um, and in film and TV, I, Learns his lines in the car. <laughs> 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 it's, it really, you know, I was doing crafts. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well you know it's it, it it really depends i'm getting i'm getting uh i think i'm getting better at it i think i had a you know when i first started i was super 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 prepared and then i was i had i was doing this show that i w i was really unhappy doing and i <laughs> and i didn't uh I, it was really bad dialogue i just didn't respect it and i really i would, I would say i know the one you mean but i'm not gonna say it the strength um it was this, this vampire show and 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 um i mean it was a lot of fun you know and, and it's a fun show to watch but in terms of the respect that the show had for its own for its audience uh it was it was just very clear from the dialogue that it just wasn't great and i i got into a very bad habit of basically starting to look at my lines in the car on the way to set <laughs> and you'd be amazed what you can do. Um, and, uh, you know, by the time it's your close up, you know your lines. Um, 
and uh but that's not a that's not a good thing to do i really <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but I think it's really important you're saying that, Corey, because for some people, you've explained the reasoning around that and knowing that's not you. But there are a lot of people out there that that's pretty much always what they do. Do you know what I mean? It's that yeah. the other side, the preparation side, doesn't compute for some people in this industry. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, it's, you know I, 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 and, 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 and I, I, I have sympathy for that. It's, I, it's hard sometimes. It's a lot easier to prepare for theater. You know, yeah. rehearsal, there's a structure around it. Uh, and in general, the, the language is richer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's more clues as to, you know, as to the complexity of the characters in the language. Uh, a lot of times with film and television, uh, you know, you have a scene and you have three lines. Uh, and then you have another scene where you have these, you know, big monologues, and of course, yeah. you're going to memorize that. But often, when you're an audience member watching a movie or or TV, like it's these little scenes that have like very few lines that suddenly are, are the most meaningful parts of the movie. And it, uh, you have to pay as much attention to that, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it can be hard when you're just looking at the script the night before and you say, oh, I only got three lines. And I was just yeah. Yeah. Um, And I'm, I, I've, 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 you know, it's still, it's still a tendency. I still can get lazy, but uh, I, I really try not to do that. I really try to, know exactly what my character wants and exactly what the moment before is and um yeah i was gonna say talking it's like also just like we haven't even gotten into this part about auditioning for film and television though which is a whole other freaking animal it, yeah <laughs> It's so, it's so hard because often you're, if you're even with these guest stars and stuff, you're going in and the scenes are often poorly written or you're just like, you're jump, you're like parachuting into this world. You're like, I don't, you know, and, and, and well, what, what, let's, let's, for the people watching, I'm going to throw in a question here. Yeah, but you, you want to work and you want to get the job. And sometimes the, 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 the end product is actually pretty good and that you want to work with the director. Maybe that sometimes it's not even a scene that exists in it, but you can't go in there with that, what we've, we've just been talking about. What do you do? No, right. What do you do to elevate that audition you're about to have, whether it's three lines or 30 lines for, you know what I mean? You still have to elevate it. So what do you do in your approach for that, you know? Um, I elevate it and also, the, the pressure, talk about like, you know, the pressure of takes when you're on set and you've already got the job, but the yeah. pressure would be like, this is, I'm going to give you everything in this one little thing, but also going to do a little less because it's film and television. So like, you're just, I think you're at oftentimes, or I am at odds with, with myself. I mean, he, he doesn't really audition for film and television anymore. And um, <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's just, it's just about making this person a real person. And I think also, I think there's a lot of, what I tend to forget is that is, what you're looking at it and first, when you first get your scene, you're like, my line, what, what are my lines? What are my lines? What are my lines? What are my lines? Like we highlight our lines. These are my lines. And then you forget that there's other people in the scene with you. And actually mm -hmm. those people, especially on camera, when you have to, I think sometimes in an audition, the listening is something we forget. And that makes you look very interesting, actually. You're focused mm -hmm. on your, your needs still of this other person who's in the room, um, even though it's a, probably a bad reader, you know? And yeah. it's, it's hard, it's so hard. They're not giving you anything or the, what they're giving you is just like, they're, they're totally oh, not good, you know? And, and bless them, you know, like, whatever. It's not their job. Or, or they're just the assistant and they're reading and they're doing their best job. But you have to, you have to imagine so much stuff you have to imagine, you know, that like, you know, I've lost you. Yeah, she got frozen out there. All oh, right, yeah, is she back? Oh, no. Yeah, okay. she she's back now. You were you were frozen for a second there, Nadia. Oh, okay. Oh. You were saying imagine. You have to imagine this scenario. Not the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Oh, oh, there we go. That's why. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, I think uh, you, you, you're, there's so much you're a mat. You're there's. I feel like 
when you're all coming in, you're imagining so much. You're like, also, if you're talking to two people in the, in the scene and there's only one reader, you're looking over mm -hmm. and in there just so you can give a different focus and, you know, you're trying to tell the story of the scene as you see it. And, mm -hmm. um, but I do think, uh, but I think also going through and really paying attention to what the other people are saying to you and uh, yeah. what, what new information you're getting and taking that in, remembering yeah. that it's a dialogue. And like, I think, yeah. I think you know, those scenes are usually just big mind because because the camera's on you. So you're really just focused yeah. on immediate, you know, instinct is like, what am I saying? How am I gonna be yeah. but yeah. but forgetting, but remembering that they're you're just seeing one side of a story that they're telling, but you have to still keep telling this story. If that makes right. sense. Yeah, absolutely. And the that the listening thing is very important because the, you will see a lot of these things. You you ask yourself, well, why is the other person talking so much? And that's very clear that they're trying to see how you react to stuff which is often the most important part of i find sometimes the most important part of acting uh, yeah. sorry that's okay it was just a little choppy for us is that better you're frozen again yeah. oh there you are you're back, oh, I think back. Great. Okay. Yeah, you're back. okay you're back no worries i'm just saying sometimes the most interesting part of it is you go into these auditions and you notice they've given the other person that isn't you a lot to say and you really have to embrace those moments about taking, taking in what they're saying, you know, in general. And that's often what, what they're casting off, you know, especially if you're going for a guest star and it's to be there opposite the lead of the show anyway and stuff, you know. Um, Corey, in your days of, yeah. if you can still remember your days of auditioning for film and TV, how did you deal with those <laughs> two or three liners and, and stuff like that where you're like, what the hell do I do with this? Because I think this is very important about sometimes we have to take ourselves, especially as theater actors, not so seriously in the sense that you want this job, right? You, you want this job, you have to find something that works in the scene, right? Oh no, we've cut off again. Can you hear us okay? Still going in and out a little bit there. Yeah, it's still going in and out a bit. Yeah, let's see. We've got full Mars here. Okay, you're there back. You yeah, you guys are back. Mm. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry. That's okay. We can't help the internet. Uh, are you Are you there? Yeah. We're here. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, de I definitely think you're, you're often playing with your, a lot of it is about ego, too, in terms mm -hmm. of you know, uh, I don't, they're, you know, they're calling me in for this thing and it's only three lines. And yeah, yeah. How can they expect me to, <laughs> to produce anything under these conditions? Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, a lot of that, you just have to just get over yourself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a lot easier said than done. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, and, and I mean, I think with that kind of stuff, it's just also remembering that everybody is in the same position. Everybody has the same bad reader. Everybody has the same uh, uh, three lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, a, it's just important to remember in terms of that too, that this is your chance to play this role. Uh, and, uh, you know, that this isn't, this isn't a contest to win something. Mm -hmm. um, this is the event. This is the thing. Um, these three lines are all you get. Um, but I find, I mean, I, but you know, it, it, when something is just three lines like that, they're looking at you, you know, mm -hmm. you, 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 it's, I mean, maybe you can create a character in three lines, but it's pretty hard. I think, you know, in that kind of situation, um, it's not about being in, in any, like I, I definitely, cause I, when I do audition these days, it's really, you know, self taping things mm -hmm. and when I, I, when I, you know, I used to do the self taping and I would do it over and over and over again until I got it perfect. And then I would finally look back at the tapes and I'd be like that last one or the second to last one was definitely the most, you know, the closest to perfect, you know, where I hit all those beats I wanted to hit and I, I, I got all these lines out, even those difficult, you know, technical words that I had to say, but it was like the second take. Or the first <laughs> because yeah. something happened 
you know, and I messed up three lines in that take and the lighting wasn't as good. And, it, it, you know, and I, I totally missed this one beat in that, but I, I nine times out of 10, that will be the take that I'll send in yeah. because I, I, I got to think that when people are, are, are looking at these auditions, they're waiting to, uh, to be surprised by something real happening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you, when you when you're seeing the same scene over and over again, you know what the beats are, and some people hit them, some people don't. But uh, you're looking for a, a person to inhabit that character, and yeah. it's often in the sloppiness, sometimes, of the mistakes that are made in effort of you know in, in, in trying to create something where a, 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 an auditioner can get a glimpse of 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 a spontaneous character being created and i think so basically don't kick kill yourself if you had a good take you were actually in it and the line went mm. I, I, that's probably the one you want being in it is more important mm. than nearly they're not auditioning they're not auditioning the scene you know what i mean they're having a look at you right yeah yeah, yeah. exactly you know what i mean it's not it's not a contest to see who's the best at memorizing lines yeah um yeah. you know what i mean uh that being said the more work that you can, well, you, know that. <laughs> um, you know, you shouldn't just, that's not, that's not an excuse to be sloppy, but it's yeah. an excuse not to, um, not to uh, only put forth the most perfected, uh, uh, you know. I think that's a really good note because I'm pretty certain that the times you feel it, you're like, oh, this is going well and the line goes and you go, damn it. And the very next time you get it, you go right through and you nail all the lines, but you know, you know you didn't feel it like the time before, and the time yeah. before is probably more valuable, you know, and stuff. We have time for one more. Sorry, finish that thought. No, no, I was just saying I can. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not a casting director, but that's my yeah. instinct that is that that's probably yeah. And I, I would say that the number of times that I've ended up booking something where I felt that I I just have been so far from nailing it as well as I did it at home and then you book it is evidence of that is that they're looking for something they're looking for the person they don't care about the scene do you know what I mean half the times those scenes have been written just for the auditioning process uh, and not going to be seen later you know it's a uh, bring yourself I guess it's the main thing you know bring right. yourself to the room and along, yeah. those lines, and along those lines is to not trip yourself up too much about what they're looking for. For oh, absolutely. You know, like trying to be something like, oh, I, I, I'll, I'll, what are they, what are they probably, I'll try to be that. They just be you. They're looking yeah. for you. They're looking for yeah. you. And yeah, so, so you don't have to do too many head games with yourself beforehand. Of what um, they might be looking for. Right. Yeah. You don't know. You have no clue. You yeah. have no clue. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. One more question, Michelle. Okay, one last question from Mike. Uh, what do you know, when do you know you're really finding your own relationship with a character and uh, not forcing something or aiming to achieve your idea of what you think it should be? That's a loaded question. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. When do you find that? Um, <clears throat> Do you have an answer? I mean, uh, my instinct is that is is it felt in your body, in your nerves, in your uh, I think, and and if you have the luxury of repetition of doing something over and over again, there's that moment where you've done it, and you're just not thinking about what's next, and. Um, and, and when you can surprise yourself. I think when you've been doing something a certain way and then something different happens and you are able to respond in the moment and, uh, um, and you start to understand the character's point of view, you don't, you're, not, you're not stretching, I think there's a, or, or reaching, there's, a, there's sometimes there's that period of time where you're bringing them to you, bringing them to you, bringing them to you, and then, mm -hmm. and, then, and then you don't have to think, well, what would they do? You just know. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I definitely think the greatest gift an actor can give themselves is, is to surprise themselves, mm. themselves, mm. you know, I mean, when you're, when you're either, either whether it's in rehearsal or on stage um, and something happens, you do something that you uh, did not 
had no had no con had no idea that that's how this character could behave. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's that that is that, that is the most thrilling thing I think you can you you can yeah. you can experience on stage, um, and um, you know you don't just you can't just throw yourself into that state. You can only yeah. get there by doing the work. You can only get there by knowing uh, by knowing your lines and knowing. Yeah. Uh, where your character came from, what he wants, um, and what his relationship is to the to, to, to the other characters. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And you know, when you and so you have those sort of parts of the algorithm, and you run the program, uh, and then sometimes uh, you know a really surprising thing comes out, and suddenly you're. Um, you know, this is where I find Chekhov is really the the the, the, the most act, the most likely place this is going to happen because mm -hmm. there's something about the way he wrote these scenes where that when Nadi was talking about how the, this sort of the the greatest joy and the greatest sorrow can sort of uh, happen in, in in the same place, and so you find yourself laughing at a funeral or. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> crying when you get a, a big check, <laughs> um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can try to sort of think your way into these things, but um, I, I, I think finding yourself surprised by this is, 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 is the greatest joy. I think that's, that's that, the word. That, Go on. that happens, that happens a couple times in a run, if you're lucky. Yes, yes, if you're, you're lucky. You can't, you yeah. can't, you can't be living expecting this transcendent uh, uh, inspiration it, 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 all the time. You have to do the play, and then yeah. occasionally something happens that 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 that, that goes the opposite the way you you thought it was going to go, and it actually it works. It's not it's not put on, and that's amazing. But yeah. you can't you can't you can't expect it every night. Fantastic. Guys, I, I mean, we got, you guys were just absolutely amazing. I can't believe the time has run out already. There were so many questions coming in. Guys, sorry if we didn't Maybe get we to your question. Them. If, yeah. You know, if, if anyone's got a burning, burning question, you can give them an email, you know. Fantastic. We do offer the option to send us the questions you want to ask and Corey and Nadia will be happy to answer them for you. That which is so amazing of them. Guys, I knew you guys, I knew I adored you guys from the moment we worked together. Nadia was still to work together fully. We'll do that at some point, I hope. You know, but Corey was such a joy. Thank you for sharing your time. Join Corey and Nadia you. On, Thank on you. Friday for the master class in which they'll be leading the master class, and I'm very excited about that. Hi, <laughs> Dennis. Hey, 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 hey. Thank you. Hi, guys. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm.